delicious. It's good. Yeah! It is truly the most exciting event that I have ever witnessed in all of my years of filmmaking. Three and a half months ago, I, I left my home in Beverly Hills to uh, come to Auschwitz and Birkenau, and so did uh, a cast and crew of uh, many, many dedicated people. The, the, the people who came to Auschwitz, the prisoners, uh, came, were pulled out of their own mother country their own environment and thrust into among strangers like Babel, you know, where people spoke different tongues. They had, their commands were in German. Uh, a lot of the people around them were Polish, Hungarian, Romanian, French, Italian. We have that same experience here. I was consumed with the, the story of a, a boxer, a true story of a man that was still living today that was forced to fight other prisoners, had fought 200 bouts, won every one of them, and the uniqueness was that his opponents would go to the gas chamber. It's a very, I think, experiential kind of film. When you come to Auschwitz, we came with 700 people getting off of a train on the platform with the SS, with the dogs, all the tempestuous kind of things that were happening. All of these events were happened to you rather than you seeing them, watching them. Okay, we'll do another rehearsal, please. I want to say it's a story of horror because it isn't. It's a story of people and how they reacted to this particular kind of horror. One of the difficulties in making a film like this is the how do you even see your characters because they're inside hundreds of other people. Now. And that's why the, the style of this film has been one where you're inside not outside. If you were trying to make a film about the sea, I would say, make the film about a cork bobbing on the surface of the sea, and it disappears under the water. And once in a while, it's tossed up in the air, and, and you get some kind of a glimpse at the awesomeness of the sea. But you follow that cork, and by the way that cork bobs and what happens to it, you intuit the forces of the sea. I think we're on a very important uh, mission. Maybe the picture will, will have an effect that whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, we will all feel that we lost a member of our family here because it was definitely an assault against civilization. I don't know what it's going to feel like, really. I mean, it's a weird scene. There's, they, when they really did it, the women were naked. It was a way to humiliate them and take away everything that they were. We don't see. We see that. See now we're getting a full effect. Oh, 
Now I understand what you said. Oh, God. Yeah, really? Willem. It's bad? Willem pointed out that when the two of us went to the Academy Award nomination lunch, where we both received our nominations. We were sitting at the table talking to a lot of people, and Willem asked me what I was going to do next. And I said, I'm doing this film about a boxer that is taken to Auschwitz and forced to fight other, other boxers, with the loser generally going to the gas chamber. And Willem didn't express himself at that lunch, but he reminded me that he thought of that. And he said, wow, would I like that role. But Willem never told me this. He could have made my life a lot easier had he told me earlier. Ah, it's real this was a difficult film to cast because I had to surround it was necessary to surround the main characters with with uh, with with people all the time I mean who were going to sleep in the bunks next to them above them below them were the people who were going to be working with them eating food with them none of that was in the script they had to cut off all their hair so sure a lot of people wouldn't do it we did have problems in the beginning with extras. We would order up a 1,000 extras for a particular scene. 700 would show up or 600 would show up. And I would say, well, where are they? Where are, where are these people? And uh, I would hear, well, they called in sick. And I, I would say, Lev, 400 people called in sick. On a regular film, on a Polish film, the extras are paid 1,800 zlatis a day. And this particular film, because they were working in a much more uh, difficult conditions and there was a bitter cold, they were paid uh, twice as that, 4,000 zlatis a day, plus a hot meal and a running hot tea. If you convert that into an uh, official rate, you'll get about uh, $10 a day. If you convert it on a block market rate, it gets you a dollar. But at the same time, we would have to say how much a worker gets a day in a regular factory. I would say that a hard laborer uh, would get approximately the same, from three and a half to four thousand zlatis a day. I mean, relatively, it's very little, but at the same time, it lasts in a supermarket longer. <laughs> This perhaps shouldn't even be recorded or filmed, I think. I agreed because a friend talked me into it. But these, these scenes are moving. When, when you start remembering, after all, I lost my whole family during the occupation, and the very sight of these SS uniforms and all make you feel sick. It's, it's, it's one big graveyard. They, they shouldn't even be making a film at all, in my opinion. But since I already agreed, well, you have to earn that extra money somehow. Just behind me is a uh, crematorium we have, which we have built for the movie. Uh, the exciting thing is that the Polish government allowed us to build the crematorium right on the site of Birkenau, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, the train would come in, the selection would be made on the platform, and then the people that were selected to be eventually gassed uh, were sent to the uh, right. Licks. And they were marched into what appeared to be a very uh, peaceful uh, house. Can you make, uh, hit it a little bit and make some sparks? Come back, you know, I think sparks are okay. It shouldn't have flames, though, huh? I mean, I'm very affected by all of this, but then I get very enthusiastic as soon as I see what the shots are going to be. And I can't, I want them to be vivid and, you know, I want to understate things, but I, I, when I see that it's happening and that the feeling is going to be there, I get very excited and I want it to be done as well as possible. So I get in a kind of enthusiasm for it, and even though I realize how macabre it is, and that's terrible. I mean, it's not like we're going to do real death, thank God, or real pain. We can't do that. Uh -huh. I think that the fact that we're working in the space and place where it actually happened always helps. Uh, it affects all of your performance, it affects all of the performance of every individual that's working on the picture.
I was with some other people, and I recall that I was tempted to almost perform my grief because I felt guilty that here I am, and I, I, I felt numb. What was going on here and how to make the film about it really both become one and the same thing for me, how to create a, a living reality. Cut. Running in great. Yeah, it'll be the two of them. Yeah. And and it's a, you know it'll be a strong shot like what you know. Yes. But like like we did before, but it comes around to the front. Great. So you set it up, and I'll keep him. We'll keep going so we don't lose any time. Yes. The situation of the people in the concentration camp is so strong, and we everybody understands that everybody here is they're gonna die and that there's beatings and, and a ruthless kind of behavior so so what we have to do is to make make the, what is extraordinary in other situations ordinary somebody was dragging a body out and the head was bumping on the ground and he's eating a sandwich and he and he doesn't doesn't react doesn't react to it I don't mean to make uh, such speeches you know it's just that it's it's really only sharing sharing our uh, understanding Bob? Yeah. Yeah. We are ready okay, great. for you to look through the camera yeah. um, this man needs help. I said shut up. Stay out. Verfluchte grechische It's It's hard to, to, to repeat what's happening here. I mean, it could die, it could be done with our technology in Hollywood and all. We could probably duplicate almost everything in here. But it would probably be one of the most horror films anybody could ever make. So, I think, I think we're better off doing what we're doing here. I mean, it must have been just horrific to try to um, evoke that on film. Uh, you can't just reproduce a reality. It's really a psychological phenomena. It's a much more difficult thing than making it look like it, it was all happening again. That, that doesn't take you into any kind of meaning. Cut! Cut it! I can't really articulate it. it, it this is the demand on all the actors has almost disallowed the acting. It's like it's forbidden. The, the event, the tapestry, the, uh, the is so uh, strong. It's uh, you can't embellish it. It's just you just do it somehow. Yeah, it's different. You try to stay objective in this medium to to allow the event to happen. But basically, it's a very subjective medium in itself because you have to pick the angles of the cameras, what exactly behavior you're going to see. This is the. This is the. Right. No, I'm just showing you. In it, you can stay or try to stay objective to the viewer. And hopefully you will not uh, try to indicate or to come up with some kind of a resolve, but rather just allow them to experience the moment and the event and let them with their own values look at the piece and come up with their own sense of understanding of what went down there. You know, there's a scene that I have in the movie where I steal bread from somebody, a, from a dying person. And we had a whole discussion about it's OK to steal from a, a person that's dead, but it's not OK to steal from somebody who's not dead. And then you think, God, we're so lucky that we don't have to think those things in real life.
My name is Stanislav Nawanch Kochanovich. I live in Krakow, and the number I had in Auschwitz was 93191. Survival in the camp was due in 90 to 80 percent to good luck, and in 20 percent it was a question of not breaking down and collapsing mentally. During the time that I was in the camp, I found out that everyone, even those who came from the prison in the best state of health, those who broke down, these people didn't live long in the camp. I was alive all the time. What sustained me, by the way, was that I'd been before in the resistance, in the ZWZ. And I was tough enough, and I always believed that the end must be such as it eventually was. And in the camp I lived with this thought, well, 1,000 people will survive the camp, and within this 1,000 there will be me. No, only 100 will survive, but among those 100 there will certainly be me. No, only 10 will survive, and among those 10 I will certainly be. Continuous faith that I must survive, I must survive. When I knew I was going to have to do some boxing, I told Arnold, I need a trainer and I want to start training immediately. And he went out and got me a very, very good trainer. His name's Teddy Atlas, and I worked with him about two months prior to the shooting. And then once I got here, he came for like four weeks to uh, sharpen me up and also to choreograph the fights and uh, do one of the fights with me in the, in the picture. All right, you made it work. We started with a foundation just like you would with a, for anything, for a house. We, we poured the blocks. We, we learned the balance, the legs, the hand position, the basic punches. And then we started on the basic moves and eluding punches. It wasn't just about learning a series of moves or learning uh, how to punch well. Again. It became about attacking okay. something that you didn't know whether you could do or not. But most of all, I was concerned that uh, I wouldn't do myself proud, that I wouldn't uh, become a good enough boxer. Mm -hmm. So I put a lot of pressure on myself. And weaves to the right, missing Silver's left hook. Distance. Okay, I, I'm late on that. Every time. Let's go. It doesn't take an Einstein to learn these movements. It takes a pretty good teacher, a fair teacher, and a good student. In a real fight, you start choking him. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's it. I think the angle should be really, really low. Should be really like in here. Ah! Like this guy's a big, like he's an earth creature, you know, he's like a big oak tree or something. Oh! Ah! It's this nimble guy dancing around, but I, I really think that's the analogy. And in the end, it's the earth that defeats this guy and puts the mud in his face. <laughs> ah! And that's when I get the close ups. Yeah. And so the final place where he gets hit, coming toward me, and I'm just this side of him. Boom, boom. He comes right down over, crashing over here. Are you okay, George? Oh, he is. Are you okay? I'm right here. Oh, 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 Shall we go? I think it's great. Yeah. 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 Freezing. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's go. I didn't wear enough, unfortunately.
You find yourself here in Auschwitz, in Birkenau, living your life, doing your work, living normally. And there's a moment when you think, no, wait, I can't. I can't allow myself to feel happy, to feel good. And then the other voice comes around and says, no, of course. We are now, we are the future. We are allowed to, we must go on and live our lives. Thursday, I feel so sad. The eagle flies on Friday. Saturday, I go out to play. Eagle flies on Friday. Saturday, I go out to play. Sunday, I go to church low. And I get on my knees, I get on my knees, I get on my knees and pray. Lord, have mercy on me. I'm dying, Lord. I'm in misery. That's why they call it Stormy Monday. And Tuesday, 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 just as bad. uses the phrase, uh, play the facts, quite often. I think uh, we've tried to get some sort of the reality of the daily life in the camps. We have never really gone for effect. This is such a strong backdrop that I think I think you realize that you you kind of have to receive it rather than working it and exploiting it. You have to do whatever it is that lets you see this place or try to see it. I think it's the last occasion to make films on this subject while we are still alive. That is the people who survived the camp. In a few years' time, there will be no one to speak out. These people will be gone. There won't be this living history. There will only be copying by people who will simply have nothing to say on the subject, who will have read about it, or will have seen some film. But all this is not it. What would make the capo hit somebody? I think the Holocaust now is in the hands of the artist in order to give it meaning. I think it, has to, it's, it is now time for to take that step, because we've all had the statistics. Yes, and then and I'm looking up, I'll get the whole thing. Bob Young is uh, a humanist, a gentle man, tackling a, a very ungentle subject. First position. Sorry. Somehow that amalgam has, has come out in a very special way with this film. Uh, Eddie, <laughs> what, where, now where will fire be coming out? The windows. The, the, those the two first, windows. The first fire would come out. The first fire would come out of the top of the chimney. So this place actually was blown up by. Uh, by uh, materials and explosives that were that were gathered together from the uh, prisoners. Some of the prisoners were working in uh, in the German factories, and they used to take spoonful at a time, and put it the women especially in their dresses and hide it in various spots, and take it take it a little at a time to the camp. And eventually, they had enough to feel like they could make an uprising. And that's actually what started the uprising. Little pinch at a time. 
Almost everybody died that was involved in this thing. But thanks to them, I think uh, over 40,000 people were saved. My name is Salomon Aroch. I born in Greece, and my state is Salonika. And uh, come to Germany, SS, Gestapo, and take them all Jews to the concentration camp in Poland, in Auschwitz, Birkenau. Here's my bed. I sleep in there. The real Salomon has been here quite a bit. He added to the authenticity of the movie. All my family is in here, in the crematorium. My mother, my father, my brother, my sister, everybody. Come to me, come to me. Come to me here. Mama! No, mama, no, papa, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll never forget these places, and I, I wouldn't have missed being here for the world. I mean, I think this has been a tremendously Im important experience personal experience to have been here, to have been in the crematoriums, to have uh, spent the time in the barracks and, and tried to imagine what it must have been like. Then they lift him, then they put him down on the floor. It's in, in, incalculable in a way, but I'll, I'm anxious to, uh, to move on to other things with the perspective that I've gained from being here. By the way, I'm alive as a result of the German discipline, because on the 14th of January in 1945, in a subcamp, I was caught attempting to escape. And after two days in a bunker, sitting in a bunker, I got the death sentence. I was to be hanged on the 20th of January during the roll call, and on the 18th of January, the evacuation took place. And I was saved by that German discipline. Order must be. In spite of the fact that they were burning the political department's papers, which means that any trace of me in the papers disappeared, it wasn't allowed to finish me off earlier, only on the day on which the execution had been planned, the 20th of January. And on the 18th of January, the evacuation took place. And thus I survived. 